Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in just a second. I'm going to let a few more people enter the webinar first. All right, I think we're about ready. Hi, everyone. I'm Mallory Batches. I'm the Director of Strategic Development here at CNU, and I want to welcome you to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. This webinar series is intended to provide a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing and emerging issues we're all facing right now. Let me know if you have ideas of something you'd like to hear about with, uh, with this webinar series, and we'll try to line it up for you. Today's conversation I'm really excited about, this is Equity Driven Planning with Mitchell Silver. Um, before I begin, uh, introducing Mitch, I wanted to let you all know that uh, Tuesday, September 1st, next Tuesday at 12 p.m., we are going to have Bring Back Main Street with Small Scale Manufacturing, the Who, the Why, and the How with Ilana Proust, who's the founder and CEO of Recast City. So be sure to mark your calendars for that and try to register ahead of time. But today, we are talking with Mitchell Silver. Mitch is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and is a fellow of the American Planning Association. His distinguished career of more than 30 years in planning includes being the immediate past president of the APA, where he was the first African American to hold the title from 2011 to 2013. Previously, he spent many years of his career in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he was chief planning and development officer and planning director. And before that in DC, where he was deputy director of the Washington DC Office of Planning. As Parks Commissioner, he oversees the planning and operating of nearly 30,000 acres of parks, playgrounds, beaches, marinas, recreation centers and facilities, green streets, concessions, wilderness areas, and all other parkland assets across the city of New York. It's a pretty big job. Um, his work as Commissioner can teach us a great deal, though, about delivering equity, inclusiveness, and belonging to all members of the community through the provision of an investment in public spaces and places and parkland. Mitch is known for his compassion, creativity, problem solving, and innovative leadership. He's been considered a thought leader within the planning industry throughout his career, and his expertise in equity-driven planning is widely known. And on a personal level, Mitch has been a professional hero of mine dating back to his work in Raleigh. And his approach to designing for all people within the built environment is one that I think we should all strive to emulate. And so I'm so happy to be turning this over to Mitch. One quick note that after his presentation, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please share any you have using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll ask them after Mitch presents. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you to Mitch for being here. Mitch, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me go ahead to this presentation. Very excited to be here. Uh, greetings uh, from New York City, uh, where we are flattening our curve. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but it's also uh, always a pleasure uh, to uh, share my thoughts with CNU, uh, enjoy the organization, have many friends. Uh, and so I'm very excited to share with you uh, my uh, perspective on the equity driven planning. Uh, now, because I'm Parks Commissioner, I will focus on some of the work we're doing here in New York City. Uh, but I'll also try to talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. Very often those terms, equity, diversity, and inclusion are mixed together and commingled. So I'll separate them so you'll understand my point of view when I do talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion. I always like to take a step back because equity is not new. Uh, at the very beginning of the planning profession back in the 1910s, uh, there was this whole desire that planning was based on scientific efficiency, civic beauty, and social equity. And at that time, both the social reformers and the planners were working together, but there was a split and the social reformers went one direction, and then those that were more focused on how to organize the city went their other direction. And so the social workers, social reform movement kind of went its own path and really didn't connect back until the 1960s when it was this whole push toward civil rights and equal rights. Uh, then it kind of went away and it reared its head again back in the 1990s when there was this strong desire for social and environmental justice uh, planning of social equity now reconciled again 
And we saw this rise of those three circles of sustainability that focused on the economy, the environment, and equity. But again, it was still just a word. No one really understood what it meant. But then it was the 2010s when the Great Recession hit and everyone now understood this whole issue about fairness and equity. People saw Main Street not recover, but they saw Wall Street recover and they said that was not fair. And equity in the past really affected uh, really people of color, those that were underserved, those that were in poverty. But the Great Recession started affecting everyone. People were losing their homes in all neighborhoods as a result of the recession. And the 2010s really brought it forefront. And now, which I'll get into the end of the presentation, uh, with the whole social unrest with Black Lives Matter has now taken equity into a whole new realm because now people are being outspoken about what has happened, not just since the 1910s, but over 400 years. Now, this is a lot of words. I don't expect you to read all of it, but I like to start this as a basis. For those really in the playing profession or design profession, it's supposed to be part of our DNA. APA has both aspirational principles and our code of ethics, and I highlighted some key words in red, which is supposed to embody what planners are about, to serve the public interest with compassion for the welfare of all people in accordance with the professional obligation to act with competence and fairness. And again, you see the words, all persons, and to promote racial and economic integration. That's part of our code of ethics, to be conscientious of the rights of others. And rights could take on many forms, from voting rights to civil rights, uh, so I can go on and on about rights and to increase the opportunities to help people and underrepresented groups advance in the profession. And then finally, we as planners should contribute time and effort to groups lacking adequate planning resources, that pro bono work to really help uplift communities. Now there's more to our code of ethics, but these are just some examples that this really, to me, uh, gives us the guardrails for our profession to make sure that it is part of our DNA and that we operate in accordance with what we believe are ethical principles. But let's go to that word equity. And I've been dealing with equity for well over 20 years and people have these very long definitions. I came up with two words to communicate what equity means and it's fair and just. People understand fairness. If any of you have children and you have a pizza party and one gets a small piece, the other one gets a large piece, some will say that's not fair and they call it out. Or if someone jumps in line after you're waiting for a long time, that's not fair. I like the notion of explaining equity for fairness because it's fair and what is just, and this is something we should certainly pursue. And it's an easy measurement. If you're in a city, you have a capital budget. And for some reason, downtown is getting the lion's share of the capital funds, yet the neighborhoods are not. That's not fair. Everyone pays taxes, but it seems like it's being focused on areas of downtown. And some people say that's just not fair. So fairness is a very easy way of explaining what equity means. And as I stated, I've been doing this work for a long time. When I was in DC, Deputy Planning Director, is our desire to create a vision for a growing and inclusive city. We knew that the east of the river and the other part of DC was not being treated fairly. So that was part of the framework of our comprehensive plan. And I was working with Nashville when they actually had a focus on equity inclusion. And this was uh, many years ago uh, when it wasn't even fashionable that they took a direct interest. And then when I was in Raleigh, uh, the 2030 plan had a whole section based on equity and prosperity. But then when I came to New York, there was a new focus. Uh, the mayor hired me to deal specifically with this issue of equity, was very concerned that not everybody had their fair share of resources and so initially there was a senator that came up with a wonderful bill. I got it. We'll just take money from the richest conservancies and channel it to the underserved parks. And I told the mayor, that's not going to work. So we said, you have six months to come up with an idea. And what we came up with was a framework for an equitable future to figure out how we can improve the park system. And in fact, when the mayor reached out to me and said, would you like the job? And I said, no. And he goes, why? I said, because parks is 80% operations and 20% planning, I'm a planner. And the mayor said, that's what I want. That's why I want you. I wanna rethink parks for the 21st century based on equity, access, and fairness. So to put things in context, uh, in order to come up with this program, we had to take a look back. New York City spent close to $6 billion over 20 years improving their park system. We added more acreage to our system, and we believe very strongly in this walk score. 
We wanted every New Yorker to be within a 10 minute walk to a park. Uh, right now it's at 81.5%. Our goal is to get to 85%. San Francisco is the only city in the US with a perfect walk score. And DC is very close to becoming the second city. But while that metric was important about proximity, to me, it was about quality. And I'll show you in a second what some of those parks look like. It's not just proximity, because I can go to some of those playgrounds within a 10 minute walk, and I would not let my child or grandchild step foot in that public space. So looking at the equity, we looked at proximity, but we also looked at quality, and we wanted to take a deeper dive. But how do we analyze equity? How do we figure out if we're being fair? In this particular case, we decided to take an, a data-driven approach, not speak to anyone, but tell us what the data is sharing. And so we took a look back over 20 years, that 6 billion being spent, and how many parks of our 2,000 parks received less than a quarter of a million dollars over 20 years, and in park planning, that means virtually nothing. And it turned out there were 215 parks. Hiding in plain sight. When community groups saw other parks being improved, they looked at their park and there was no improvement. That's children, families, seniors, without a quality place that they could enjoy, create memories and grow in New York City. We felt that was not fair and it had to change. So what the mayor did, and I give him a lot of credit, Mayor de Blasio decided to invest over $300 million to recreate, not just do a light paint work, but recreate 67 of the 215 parks. We did some target improvements in the short term because our process takes about three to four years to totally rebuild a park. And we just went in there just to do some sprucing up to show the community we've noticed, we cared, we're sorry that you had to wait 20 years uh, for something to happen, but we decided to go in to do some improvements. And to put it in context, that's from kindergarten to college, your park saw no improvement whatsoever. And every neighborhood in New York is thriving. We want to have a public space in every neighborhood. So this was really detrimental to those communities. So there's one of your nice New York City parks. This is lovely. You can go there, roll around the asphalt, have a good time. This in New York City is considered a park. In fact, this is within that 10 minute walk to a park. And you can go there and enjoy the asphalt. The council member and I were looking for one blade of grass. and so. We determine if this is really a park or a parking lot. And in fact, sometimes the teachers do use this as a parking lot. And this is what the neighborhood had to use as one of their public spaces. Now, this one I enjoy a little bit more because there's a bench and trees. So I suppose you can have a picnic there and have a good time. This park too was within that 10 minute walk. And to me, this is no place for a person to really enjoy. You see the playground there in the background. And I just felt that this is not a place where people can go to get healthy to form memories and make connections. And so we knew we had to change something. And then, I don't know if this is unique to New York, uh, but we have these signs that unless you're accompanied uh, by a child, if you're an adult 12 and over, you cannot go in. To me, this also was not fair because if I'm a senior citizen and I see a bench in a comfort station, I have to walk another, who knows, 10, 15 minutes to find a park I can go in. We felt that was not fair. So you know, all these signs were changed my alternative was that I'd have to create a concession where you can rent a child to go into the public space. And I didn't feel that that was going to work. So we decided to change all these signs because for our senior population it just wasn't fair. And you could get a violation if you actually sit in this park and a police officer or park police happen to come by. So we decided to take a whole new approach. It's unfair, but how we're going to fix it. We decided to do our top design approach to recreate, not just paint it, but from the ground up, break up the asphalt and redesign all of these 67 parks. But we wanted to make sure we had these features since they're town centers, town commons, they wanted to be attractive and used for all ages. Spray features, they're available throughout the year. Yes, when it's warm, you could activate the spray, but when it's not, uh, and it's winter time, you can still have kids play on these wonderful formations. Adult fitness equipment, very popular in New York. We wanted to use vibrant colors. Since now these are town centers, get away from the dark gray colors, happy colors, uh, kids would enjoy them. And now these become these incredible, like I said, town centers, these outdoor living rooms for people to enjoy. I cannot begin to tell you uh, when we went to our public meetings, how often people wanted to break up the asphalt and wanted green. Study after study will show you the connection of green space to your mental health. 
because parks aren't just for physical health, they're also for mental health, but there's also stormwater capture. So the parks are doing double duty. It's adding these beautiful gardens that people can enjoy as a respite, but also is taking water off of uh, the, the network and putting them here into our park. And then finally, we have an aging population. All of our parks now are multi-generational for all ages. We're putting in lots and lots of seeding. We push back on a fear of what about the homeless. We plant what we want to see, not what we don't want to see. And we make sure there's plenty of seating for people of all ages. We even have places, if you're in a wheelchair or have ADA issues or a stroller, uh, there are some of our checker tables that have a missing chair so you can put a child uh, or a loved one that can sit there and enjoy it with you as well. So I'm gonna walk through some examples of what uh, this looks like. This is uh, one of the parks that hadn't been touched in 20 years. Uh, Garrison Park is right across the street from a community college in the South Bronx, a very troubled neighborhood, but it's on its way back. Uh, you can see from the entrance, it's not the most inviting park you wanna go into, but this is a New York City park. Now, other than the other ones that's covered with asphalt, this one in fact did have some native vegetation. And so there it is. Uh, and I want you to stop and look for a second. I was embarrassed when I saw this, that this was actually part of the New York City Parks system. Would you let your child play here or even your dog play here? It just was not an inviting place. So this is one of the parks that got the full makeover. It is right now under construction. Uh, this is the design. It was intended to take advantage of the very multi-generational neighborhood, the students that go to school across the street. And so uh, access for us was critically important. And now you see the, that is the community college in the background that now this is gonna be envisioned uh, as a town square with a water play and a splash pads, multi-generational people to enjoy. This is now under construction and should be finished. We had the COVID pause, but it should be finished soon. And I can't begin to tell you how excited the public is that they now, for the first time, as long as they can remember, have a quality space that they can enjoy and not that jungle that you saw in the previous slide. I do want to share one of these powerful stories, uh, Ms. Back for a second. Uh, there are so many stories I can share with you about the impact of this program. There was one park we opened up in Brooklyn. It was your typical asphalt playground, the one I showed you in the two of the slides. And on opening day, there was this boy about eight years old, Hispanic. He would not go into this public space, wouldn't go in. I asked one of my staff to approach this boy to say, why won't you come in? This is now for you. There was now a running track, synthetic turf, new brand new play equipment, landscaping, and he wouldn't go in. This little boy said he wouldn't go in because he said he didn't know how much it cost to go into that public space. It was that nice, he thought he had to pay for it. And that really struck me. Uh, there's a little boy, you see him on the track. Uh, and I can't begin to tell you how his life's gonna change through all the children in that neighborhood. He was not used to seeing something like this. He thought something like this, he had to pay for because it was too nice to be free. This is now becoming the place where everyone can gather. The boy kept running around, his father was taking pictures. And I can tell you that now this boy's childhood the families in this community now have a world-class public space that they can enjoy. That's what fairness is all about. That's what it makes sure that you make all the resources are distributed in a fair manner because people in the community are being affected and their lives are being changed. On the lower cost side, uh, we decided to do this other initiative called Cool Pools. Well, what is Cool Pools? Well, for one, we're very excited. You gotta be cool. So Cool Pools had a couple of meetings. We wanted people to be cool, you know, temperature wise. Be cool, don't uh, misbehave, and then be cool. So Cool Pools had this wonderful tagline that my staff came up with. And essentially, we had about uh, 17 1970s era pool decks. And we wanted to take it from a pool to an engaging, vibrant place for the community to enjoy. We felt that municipal pools, which could be pretty ugly looking, uh, that we wanted to make sure we wanted to treat them like all pools that you see at a resort. And so this is what it looked like. There were these modules that were placed in the 1970s, cracking concrete, not very pleasing. You see the mold all over the place. And we felt a municipal pool does not have to look like this. The community deserves better. You, know, you see some public housing in the background. So we decided at low cost, 150,000 
per poll, then we decided to do a major transformation to change it from this, which you see, which is pretty horrible, to this. Simple. Now people are calling this the resort. Uh, we went ahead with this whole design palette uh, by having cool elements. We had snow cones dripping. We had our parks logo. We had Adirondack chairs for all ages. And we used the right colors to make it feel fun and refreshing. Here's just another angle of it. You start seeing, which I love, the Marco Polo along the edge to make it a destination. A municipal pool does not have to be like a municipal pool. It can look like any resort that you see when you go on vacation. And it's been so popular. There you see the, the snow cone just melting just to show that it's cool. Uh, we got our horticultural staff to put in plants. We got a lot of the furniture donated by various companies. And now capacity is going through the roof where we have to put people online to queue up just to get into the pool. And I can go on and on. Here's a police officer involved in the, the cornhole. And then there's just the beautiful example of what looked like a very bad place. There's a Marco Polo again for a very low cost. We're thinking differently about how do we make these spaces more equitable, attract more people, and offer people more dignity in what is an amazing amenity for people to enjoy over the summer. So a result of all these initiatives, we've now completed 48 of the 67 of the community initiative parks, and we'll now have improved 70 acres of parkland that look like the one I showed you in the South Bronx. We also work the local community to create these friends groups, and 82% of the 48 now have a friends group. There were stewards that help care for these parks, and I can tell you the good news is we're not seeing any vandalism. When you respect the community with quality material, they expect you respect you back in return, and we're seeing great stewardship in all of our parks that we've renovated, and now usership compared to other parks have increased by 50%. That means more people getting to know one another, more people getting healthier, both physically and mentally, and more kids have a great, safe place to play. I want to quickly talk about diversity uh, because, again, those terms are often mixed up. I can tell you what diversity is not, and diversity is not meeting your EEOC hiring requirements or making sure that you have a person of color on your contract to get the project. Uh, it's not a marketing ploy. Diversity very often is used as like, oh, we just need to have one person at one token planner to get the job. That's not what diversity is. Uh, so that's something I want to be clear. What diversity is, is the value of different perspectives. Working with different cultures, race, income, disability. It's not black, white. It's all of the above. Diversity is a socially and morally responsible thing to do. It adds value to the decision-making process because you have more perspectives, more voices, as part of the planning process, to me, it is the ethically responsible thing to do as design professionals and as planners. And clearly, as we see demographics changing, it's our future. So it's about the value of different perspectives, not just race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, generations. It's all of the above. And so I make sure when we do our work, uh, we look at the demographics of the community. We do this analysis and make sure that these voices are represented. We don't want to plan for who just shows up at the public meeting. We want to do our additional outreach once we do our demographic analysis to know that we're actually hearing from those diverse voices because it does produce a much better outcome. Here's an example of what I mean. That same playground, Lafayette Playground, is in a mixed community. Uh, we did an outreach session. This one tended to be Hispanic, Asian, and Black. At our visioning session, everyone seemed to just go to their own table and do their uh, recommendation for their design. We did our engagement, but the most powerful thing happened when we started to report out. The young African ma male that you see there in the maroon shirt, uh, he was the first to present. And when he got to present, I watched all the women at the table with the Asian women, and they were tensing up because I guess they were going to hear them say there's going to be basketball and all these active sports. The first thing that young man said was that they walked through that playground every day and they noticed the Asian women and men doing Tai Chi. The first thing this society must include is a plaza for the Asian Americans to do Tai Chi. And you could have heard a pin drop. It was that beautiful moment by adding that diversity in the room produced a much better outcome. Here is the design that we came up with. Uh, and you'll see the leaves at the top. I'll show you a closer picture. 
And that represents all the different voices producing a much better outcome. Yes, the basketball was there, but this is a very inclusive, diverse play space. Uh, so it went from this and now it's completed. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, nice overhang for people who want to do Tai Chi, whether it's uh, raining or whether it's sunny. That's the plaza that they designed with the leaves for people to do Tai Chi. And I stated there's this covered space if people wanted to either picnic or do Tai Chi. So this is a great example of what diversity looks like. I want to click quickly shift gears to inclusion because again, that's the other term that's also always intermingled with equity. Inclusion means to be included and not to be excluded. Uh, it's for all people in the design press process, for all people in community engagement and avoid designing exclusive parks in public space. When I go into a certain neighborhood and see bocce and ping pong, it's like timeout or no basketball or no areas to eat. We as designers can design a space that feels exclusive. I don't feel welcome there, whether the food that they offer or how the space is designed. And as designers, we have to understand the culture, the spirit, the attitude, and have a full community engagement, not just outreach, to understand the soul of this community so people do not feel excluded. And I've been to places, the minute I walk in, I don't feel welcome here. It's like, what are you talking about? Just the design elements, what's placed in this public space, I don't feel welcome. We want to plan spaces for all because parks and public spaces are democratic spaces designed for all. This is one example. I was in Akron, Ohio. This is a metro park system. And there was a history through the design where people just did not feel welcome. And I ha actually had a therapy session and explained to people that the African-American women who were older that came there with a lot of anger, it wasn't about the current planning process. It was a 30 years of anger they were holding in that they were hearing at this public meeting of being planned and planned and no progress had been made. They wanted to make sure that they were heard because far too often the planners and designers were tone deaf and they were trying to tell them how this design would address their concerns when they wanted to go far deeper and it did not include some of those design elements. Now, I took this picture and I had to to CNU. I was so blown away by this example. This is when CNU had their Congress in Detroit. And I happened to walk by and saying, wait a minute, there is a basketball court in downtown Detroit. This was probably the most powerful image that I've seen in a long time. Why? Detroit, predominantly black city, is on its way back. Campus Marsh Park decided to put a park in the heart of downtown. And they had the audacity to put a basketball court in the center of downtown. What that spoke to me is that this city is on its way back and you are urban youth, you matter. We're putting you center stage. Most places will take a basketball court and say, oh, no way, well, we put that in our downtown. In fact, it's hard to put basketball courts anywhere. Most will take the rims down if there's one shooting or one gang activity. Detroit said, you matter, we're putting you in the center of the downtown. And I asked people and they said, no, there have been no issues, no instances. And to me, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, they used a creative court technique, which we're using more and more in New York City to show that you actually can have basketball and turn around to be something that's inclusive and embrace in the community. This is the one we did in the Lower East Side. This is now very popular with tournaments. We're now hiring, hiring artists to do the sports coding. And now we're replicating this throughout the city. It's a way of having basketball that's inclusive, shows people that are welcome, and they're not on the outskirts or we don't take the rims down because one incident happened to occur. And our parks are destinations for culture. This is Afropunk, the most popular festival, I think, in the world, they happen to have them all over the place. And every year photographers come just to capture uh, all the different outfits, but it's rich in culture. That's what public space does. It brings in that culture, it's diverse, it's beautiful. This is an Astoria Park every year. The indigenous population come here and have this amazing festival. That's what park spaces are all about. Or picnics, family reunions, food. I've been to so many parks and people who are playing for parks like saying, no, we don't want picnic table. We don't want to have any barbecue areas. People come together around food. And it's something we have to think about as we plan for public spaces, eating, gatherings, benches is all part of it. And this is something that I'm so excited about. And I'm hoping more and more places will embrace the eating part of public spaces. 
I'll end with this one about another example of being inclusive. This is in Green, uh, Greenville, uh, North Carolina. Uh, there was a project where that decimated a neighborhood through urban renewal. Uh, you can now see uh, the building of the church, the Stark Church, it was burnt down. And now the city was ready to start to create a park at this location, but there was so much pain based upon the urban renewal to the black neighborhood and the church that so just happened to catch on fire that there was a lot of wounds and healing the community had to go through. The community reached out to Zena Howard, a well-known black female architect from Perkins and Will, and went through this process with the community of doing this design the right way. This is a story unto itself, but it wasn't just putting up black art to say we've checked that box. They wanted to go deeper and understand exactly spiritually, culturally, what did the community feel about this public space? And now this one is under construction. And as you can see from the line from uh, the former parks planner, Perkins and Will brought people through the journey. They listened and were able to transform the community's words and ideas into a design. It was inclusive, it was engagement, and now the people there feel welcome. This is what the design looks like. And uh, I believe this park is under construction and now a true asset and a gathering place where people can really feel the spirit from the past, but now they're ready to go forward. I'm gonna end on this one because now, as I said, uh, both Black Lives Matter and COVID colliding into one. We had Breonna Taylor here in New York. We had Christian Cooper, who was a black birder who approached the one in the park and it could have gone sideways and could have ended, who knows how, what would have happened, but it was not a good predicament when she was accusing him of potentially creating harm to her. Later that night, George Floyd uh, uh, was killed and really set off uh, really from the social isolation from COVID to what had happened to George Floyd, uh, Christian Cooper and Breonna Taylor set up a chain reaction we all know about. And uh, public space seemed to be a major place where people wanted to express how they felt. Uh, being in parks, uh, I felt it was very important that uh, I have a conversation with my black staff. I put out a statement uh, expressing how I felt that personally it was a scab ripped off of a wound. I've been suppressing my feelings of being black my entire career where I had to check my black identity at the door. And so this was a painful letter I had to write to staff what eventually we made public, but we had these reflections to talk to our staff about how they felt. A lot of my friends and white allies kept saying, what can we do? I said, before you ask, what can I do? First ask someone, how do they feel? And that was our first effort is that we had these reflections about how staff felt about what was going on and it became clear, this was June, that it wanted to show solidarity with the black community, as did I. And so we realized Juneteenth was around the corner, a day of celebration. And we decided to rename a portion of one of our parks downtown that happened to be the site of a lot of protests. And we renamed it Juneteenth Grove. Uh, it so happened, it was God destined spot because we did a couple of things. I wanted to have it uh, symbolic so we planted 19 trees and we wanted to paint 19 benches. It so happened the entrance of the space literally had exactly 19 benches. And so we painted it the pan African colors as you can see it right here. We unveiled it on June 19th. And this became a space uh, which is a space for protest, for reflection, for celebration. And we are now looking at all of our park spaces that were named uh, of for questionable individuals. So we're now going to rename uh, some of our parks and our buildings after local, national, or global Black leaders. And we'll announce it on November uh, 2nd, which is Black Solidarity Day. Uh, this was a whole team effort. Uh, this is Karina Smith. She was one of the individuals on that reflection call. We came up with the idea. I had the honor uh, because since it was Juneteenth, and it was really representing the day uh, that we were emancipated. I prayed the roots go down to touch the past and the branches above to the future. So I wanna say a prayer for all the ancestors that had passed before us. And that was a tree that I helped plant. So it was very meaningful for all of us, a lot of tears that day, and it really showed us solidarity. And this is what we mean by really thinking very differently, being inclusive and providing a public space for a variety of reasons, rather than just putting up a work of art or a plaque. Uh, this was a whole group that put it together, so we're very diverse. But it was a very, very moving day. You can now see the sign, Juneteenth Grove. 
and now is a place that people come uh, just to take pictures, just to spend some time near the prey and connect with the past. So as I close, we must create more equitable, diverse, and inclusive public spaces for all people. And I want to underscore, we have to make sure it is for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, that was really wonderful and a really um, uh, uh, touching uh, story and, and, you know, installation that y'all have done there at the end that you've uh, highlighted. And um, we have some good questions. I want to remind everyone that uh, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want to submit a question and there's, there's a question here that came in early and and I'm thinking about you know your your most recent comments there Mitch at the end of your presentation um, the question is about the issue of fairness and fairness in the moment versus fairness over time and um, you know asking about uh, talking about the distribution of resources over time even if you only talk about like say since 1910 or something um, and and how that level of fairness can be better imbued into you know, public spaces, public facilities, um, and people's experience of that fairness or lack thereof can be you know, celebrated and, and reflected upon in, in public spaces as well. Well, it's very hard to go back to 1910, but we went back 20 years. Mm -hmm. And doing the analysis to me is the first step. I remember when I was in North Carolina, I help a council member in Greensboro for capital budget. Everyone paid taxes. I mean, some paid higher than others, but everyone paid taxes. Yet her district was not getting any of the capital dollars. And if you're a planner or you wanna ask the question, you wanna make sure if everyone's paying taxes to create an entire city, community, or town to be a healthy place, you should look at the capital dollars to make sure it is distributed fairly. A lot of people say, oh, let's do downtown because that's the economic driver, but people live in neighborhoods. People want those amenities to make neighborhoods livable. So the first thing I'll do is anytime you have a capital plan, make sure it is distributed equally. The same thing goes for maintenance. Whatever you deploy, you can't have one neighborhood that's maintained better than the other. So fairness should be across the board, how you hire, how you train, how you promote, how you distribute resources, and then the public spaces. You know, I, I said in the pre-call, urbanists and plans are taking a lot of heat right now from a lot of the Black Lives Matter that is racist, you don't care, you're insensitive, biking is anti-Black. Uh, these are things we have to listen and not be tone deaf to understand what it is. The concern is with Vision Zero, if we have enforcement, they're targeting people of color. If you're in a public space, they feel as if you're targeted. You know, if you have a nice white couple sitting on a bench, they look great. You have three Black teenagers, they're loitering. So I think it's just our perception about how we treat people in public space. I want to eliminate that word loitering entirely. It's all based on how you perceive someone. So look at fairness, how we approach, how we plan public spaces, how we plan the resources, be it capital or maintenance, and how we treat people in public spaces. I'll be honest, there are some places I go to, I look at the food options, I want comfort food. This stuff is so fancy, I'm sorry. I don't, this is not for me. This is some elite group of people. And so it may be subtle, but that's what I mean by being welcoming for all. If we have concessions, I wanna make sure there are food that everyone could enjoy or a number of concessions where people have options versus something that is so high end and so expensive. It's like, this place is not for me. So these are things we have to think about. It's gonna be hard going back to 1910, but at least we'll look at the immediate future to find out how we can be more fair, more equitable, and more inclusive as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and related to that, someone asked a question here about uh, they live near Prospect Park and the Prospect Park Alliance pays for a lot of operations and small neighborhood parks seem to be more neglected by comparison, relying on the, the budget to, to yeah. support those facilities. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that sort of challenge of, you know, it's like when I mentioned to my mother that I was going to be moderating and she said, so he looks over Central Park. And I said, well, yeah, and, you know, a whole lot of other parks. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you in your role help support and lift up those many, 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 you know, much smaller facilities? So a little news flash about the person who is about Prosper Park. Prosper Park is a hybrid. Uh, about a portion of it is maintained by the Prosper Park Alliance. 
and a portion of it is maintained by the Parks Department, so it's a joint relationship. Uh, but we do benefit from our conservancy partners that raise funds they help care for it. But about about more than half the park is maintained by park staff. What we try to do is work with our park stewards. We work with volunteers. Uh, we're down about 1,700 employees, uh, and people are coming to parks more than ever during COVID. Uh, and so it's been tough keeping up with the maintenance operations and the litter cleanup. So we're launching a campaign for people to help us. But now we have impact days where we want the public to come out and help. Uh, at, but for now, our parks always meet or exceed the ratings. This summer is a bit different uh, because we're down uh, about 25% of our staff. Uh, but we do rely on conservancies to help care for the parks. And we now are relying more and more on volunteers. During COVID, we're just down so many. We want these parks to be beautiful. Uh, but we make sure all parks are maintained to the same standard. We have inspection ratings. We have inspectors that go out twice a year. And any park that fails, we have to call the supervisor in to find out what's going on. We want to make sure all of our parks are treated the same, regardless of where they're located, whether there is a conservancy or there is not a conservancy. My goal is to make sure all the parks look great. That's great. Well, and you mentioned uh, COVID-19 and, and you know being down on staff, but I, I want to bring that a little broader in, in some of the realities of COVID-19 and obviously equitable management of, of open space of public space is a particular challenge uh, because of the pandemic. And so I'm sure you've learned a lot of lessons. Your, your um, staff has learned a lot of lessons through this, but are there key lessons that the pandemic has shown a spotlight on that planning needs to be bringing into the future much beyond the pandemic? You know, things that this sort of unveiled uh, that we should have been doing all along. Well, for one, there's no question that people saw the value of parks in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, parks are always there. I used to joke around because it's like, why can't parks get funding like other city services? And I said, you know, one day we should just shuttle the parks down for people to know the value. Little did I know that dream kind of came true with COVID uh, because when everything started shutting down every major gathering places, parks remained open. And our parks employees were coming to work. And so people started calling them havens of hope. I call them sanctuary of sanity. Uh, it was the only place you can go to feel alive during COVID. And so people now understand that. It's a little bit sad that now with the budget shortfall, uh, we had such huge revenue losses uh, that we cannot sustain the parks that we have in the past. But people now are looking at parks very differently. And now there are a lot more allies and advocates saying we have to do more for our parks because of the role they serve, not just for recreation, but also for mental health. And so that's, I think, one takeaway. The other one is that uh, Lanier Parks, uh, the High Line had a challenge reopening, I'm guessing Chicago 606 and others, there were challenges to how you can social distance on these linear parks. And as a runner, I would freak out when somebody's running by with a mask on, huffing and puffing, or on a bike. So, you know, should we start looking at the widths of some of our bikeways and walkways so that people can socially distance? The High Line now is a time entry. You can only go one way versus going back and forth. So I think going forward, the passive parks really helped quite a bit. Uh, and people could social distance, but all our other amenities, playgrounds, basketball courts, you know, skate parks, it became a challenge. So we're not going to change our approach, but I think the one area I'm going to look at is some of those more constrained paths and linear parks where you don't have the ability to keep that six foot distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot more hand sanitizing, a lot more, you know, comfort stations where people can wash their hands. So that to me may be part of our future as we look at the parks, like having them more strategic where people at least wash their hands or, you know, that's something that we are taking a look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another question here uh, that is a little bit about the technicality of how you described how the parks funding works. But um, the question is, why was it impossible to require that any contribution to a specific park conservancy have a specific portion, say 15%, uh, shared with the parks not supported by a conservancy? What's, what's the inhibition to that? Well, one is that this is a city asset, and so this should be borne by the taxpayers. And so I told the mayor, we got to put our money where our mouth is, and the mayor agreed. The good news is the conservancies were on board, and I sat down with them. We were able to get a contribution of $5 million per year for three years. So they were able to contribute close to $15 million, and they support equity. They understand it. Uh, parks are for all, and so they're doing their part. Central Park is open to everyone. It's not just the exclusive residents who live around Central Park. It's open to everyone, Crossing Park, all the other parks. 
So they were on board with the equity. They helped us out caring for some of our uh, other parks. Uh, Central Park, for example, helps us with the historic Holland parks. They, they help train some of our staff on the unbelievable turf management that they do. The High Line is helping with gardening and public art. So each of our conservancies stepped up, but I just felt it wasn't unfair. If I'm a contributor and I'm given to Central Park, it's for Central Park, it's not for another park. And lo and behold, Central Park created this um, other program to help other parks and they got people, private donors to give to that initiative to help other parks throughout the city. So New Yorkers will step up and give, but if I give you money for something and then you take it for something else, I don't feel that's fair. If you ask me to help other parks, I'll do that and that's just what some of our private donors did. But the bottom line is the conservancies were on board. These are public assets the public needs to take care of and shouldn't rely solely on the private sector unless the private sector like Central Park wants to do value added improvements to their park. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. So it's like tithing, but even with tithing it's voluntary. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy. Um, so we have a question here, um, and we'll, you know, this, this starts to get into a lot of different topics, really. But the question is, how should we be designing public spaces and public places to make everyone feel safe? And, you know, this gets to the question of policing. Um, there's, there's, you know, inherent policing, there's, there's, you know, in, there's personal, you know, personal policing, community policing, there's a lot of different aspects. There's the design that polices people's behavior, right? And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that aspect of that issue of safety as it, as it relates. Now, the safety, safety cuts across a lot. There's safety about, do I feel safe in this public space? Is it well lit? Are there good sight lines? And so that's something that for us is absolutely important. We have this initiative called Parks Without Borders to make sure that Parks are transparent, they're open, they have good sight lines, they're well, they're well lit. But then safe in terms of me as a person of color, do I feel safe in this space? That's a combination of enforcement and that's the work we're doing, community policing, that like I said earlier, if there are three black teenagers sitting on a bench, uh, are they safe to be there without being viewed as being loiterers or people being intimidated by their presence? That's more of community education and the perception of how people perceive danger. If you see a group of young black youths, do you feel safe or do you feel in danger? And that's more of an education. Or either our parks enforcement or our police, who do they approach uh, for what rule? Uh, there was a big debate that far more many people who were black were being approached for not wearing a face covering than those who were white. And so when people feel safe, can I go there without being harassed by enforcement agents? And that's really not on the planner side, it's more on the law enforcement side and that work is underway. There's better cooperation now. We have community members meeting with the police about what is a safe space. Uh, and so that's just an ongoing conversation. So it's law enforcement, but it's also the design. Uh, are you designing a space that is welcome for all? Uh, I told you about bike lanes and other things that was new to me, but I had friends like saying, oh, these urbanists are always fighting for bike lanes, but here I am in New York City, they get stopped for violating the vision zero rules. And so I'm not comfortable with all these bike lanes. It's not something that I believe is for our community. So that's a debate I'll let urbanists and some of the Black Lives Matter advocates work out. Uh, but those are some of the issues I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and related to that, we, we have a pretty uh, pointed question of if you wanted to weigh in on your feelings of septet and if that's, you know, yeah. <laughs> This is topic, uh, our, like I said, uh, sometimes people want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Parks Without Borders program uh, was built on some of the SEPTEP principles. Uh, we had parts that uh, I didn't put it in this presentation, but you literally could not see in the park. The whole hit, the success of Bryan Park, a lot of drug dealing, high walls, high fences, high bushes. They removed them. And now there are better sight lines. Yes, it's a very high end park, but the point is, is that. The drug activity went, went away. They put good uses to push out the bad uses. They lowered the fences and removed some of the barriers so you can see in. It's the same principle for a lot of our parks. They're now safer. A woman wants to be able to see through, to see her sense of safety. And so through our Parks and Borders program, we're moving fences, we're lowering fences, we're moving those barriers, we're making parks more accessible, and we're making sure they're active so that they actually feel safer. Now that's just a portion of the SEPTEM principle. Some are using kind of the evil twin side of the uh, SEPTAP to say 
it is destructive, but our parts of borders have been highly successful making parts safer. Uh, and so as a result, people just feel better putting benches now on the sidewalks because parks close, sidewalks never close, but it puts eyes on the public space and people feel safer. So I'm a supporter of parts of SEPTAP. I'd love to get a debate to understand why people are opposed to it. Uh, so like I said, very often um, people take that one perspective and they push it to say, this doesn't work. Uh, I've been doing SEPTAP for a long time and I see the value of some of the principles, not all. And Parks Out Borders is one example where it's been extremely, extremely successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, we, have a, we have a really good question here uh, coming from Miami Beach, Florida. And the, the question is, what can concerned residents do to pressure for change in municipalities that just operate on the decide, announce, and defend mode? Um, you know, even cities like Miami Beach, this person is suggesting people don't seem to understand or care the concept of inclusion and design occurs at the whim of the latest stakeholder. I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, people vote and you have to make this absolutely mandatory. Uh, everyone pays taxes, even if you're a renter, you're paying taxes to your landlord. So yes, if you're a renter, you're a citizen and you count. It's not just about homeowners. So this is something you have to demand. Uh, parks, public spaces are for all. And some will have to tell me, are you part of all or you're not part of all? If that's the case, they privatize it and then give the taxpayers a refund. You have to demand this from your elected officials or you put someone else in office. The, the future of our cities, as we become more dense, they are gonna be more fierce competition for the public realm and more people wanna use the public realm. And you have to design it in such a way that it is inclusive for all. I can get a whole conversation about the homeless because homeless actually come under for all. Uh, but that's a whole separate conversation. But you have to pressure your elected leaders <clears throat> that you want an inclusive system for all that all feel welcome. And that is something you just have to demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I do here in New York, we have many, many allies that are pushing for more inclusivity. There was a situation in Prospect Park where this gentleman kept taking pictures of these Mexicans were having a barbecue in a section of Prospect Park where it wasn't allowed. I took a look at it. He said, do something about it, and I did. I allow that area now to be, to, to have picnicking and barbecuing. And that's not the answer the man wanted. He wanted it to be exclusive. And my feeling is if they're coming there, why do I want them to march a mile across the park to an area that I felt from an equity point of view, that area should have been more inclusive to people that live close to that part of the park. So you gotta be daring, you have to push for it. And if you believe in uh, being inclusive, uh, then you speak up and tell your elected officials, we're taxpayers, we demand this. Um, well, and, and this is a little related to that, but I had a question for you. You, you brought up the, you brought up sustainability and the, the overlapping, you know, sort of aspects of social and environmental and economic uh, sustainability and the interconnectedness there. And you also had a slide about stormwater capture landscaping and, and, you know, tying that to the fact that there are mental health benefits from greenery. And so, you know, some of these things are, are interrelated, but I'm wondering, how important is it for your office to the, the communication and engagement aspect of that sort of connectivity plays into your ability to work with the local community to get the local community to embrace you know new designs or new new ins installations how does how does communication and engagement work in that well first uh, my all cnu speech i used to look at those three circles and i would tell people that no one's serious about the equity and I felt get rid of it because you do the economy and the environment and no one really paid attention. So I felt that they were not being sustainable because they only did two of the three. Uh, but our principle is that we believe in community engagement, not outreach, engagement. That is fostering a relationship with the community, getting to know them, just like you're dating someone to be engaged. You wanna foster that relationship to get to really understand them. You can't do that on a Google map. You have to go there, feel the community, talk to them, understand the local culture. For every park design we do, we have a community engagement process, which means the presenters talk less and listen more. To me, the communication is about listening and hearing those stories. I shared you the picture about Metro Parks. Uh, that woman that was there for 30 years said it was the best meeting she's ever had because for the first time people were listening to her and not being defensive because she came off as being confrontational and now they ended up with a very good park design. Otherwise, people end up 
tone deaf. So we have public engagement. We make sure as many generations are there, the kids are great. Their imagination for park planning still is hard to, to meet, but from tree houses, to Ferris wheels, to parachutes, to whatever it is, but we make sure that they're involved as well. Uh, we have interpreters if we need it, but we really want to make sure we're listening. That's the main thing about public engagement is that you're listening and observing. I'll walk the neighborhood to watch how people behave and then confront them. People says, oh, these tall buildings are blocking out all the light in our park. Yet I go to a park and every person's running under a tree for shade. So, you know, we, we got to talk about this. You know, is it really the building? But if shade is important, you know, shadows do move. I'll never forget what the woman said. There's a shadow and shade are two different things. I'm like, I've never heard that one before. To me, they're the same. But you really have to spend time to get to know the community. And if they don't show up, look for them. Don't just plan for who shows up at the meeting. If you truly want to engage the public, do your homework and reach out to them. And so I imagine that's that's all the more difficult since March of this year. And have you have you have you found that um, you know that have you found? I mean, I, I suppose municipalities are facing the the fact you know all over the country that they have to invent new ways of you know being able to connect with citizens and finding ways yeah. to be able to listen. Yes, it's we got to do. What we have to do uh, some construction is on pause for those projects moving forward. You know, Zoom seems to be taking over the planet. Uh, it's not the same, but if we want a project to move forward, we have to hear from the community. Yes, it's a lot harder. There's no question about it. So we're hoping, you know, once this pause is lifted, once we have a vaccine that people are comfortable with, we do want to go back to normal. Be absolutely right. This is a challenge for everyone. And I'm open and willing to hear if someone has the best practice, but it's tough. It's yeah. really tough. Yeah. I, I have to believe if New York City finds it a challenge, every other municipality is <laughs> going to feel the same. Um, so I have one last question here that, that's a little bit of a philosophical one uh, that I thought I would close on, which is that uh, the person suggested they really like the formulation of equity as just and fair that, that you presented in, in your slides. But how do you respond to those who say, as a lot of parents do, I have a child, I think I've said this before, uh, to your child of life isn't always fair. And, and how do you respond to that within the context of a, you know, of a city and, and all of the residents yeah, within it? I think they're talking about those circumstances which are certainly outside of your control. <clears throat> when it comes to a city where you have a budget and a staff, where you're caring for it, uh, to me is a lot more de definable. But clearly there are certain things that happen you know, there's a storm that comes through and your house gets hit, not the house next door. Why did that happen? Uh, or unfortunately, if someone comes down with a, you know, a, a disease or an ailment, you know, life is not fair. I think those are things I can understand to say you can't control it. When it comes to budgets, when it comes to resources, when it comes to planning, those are things we can control and we should adopt this approach of being fair and just. Uh, you just have to have that mindset and that philosophy just to be clear, I'm just not fair about how I plan, how I treat my staff, how I treat my wife, how I treat my friends. To me, it's a value I embrace across the board. So it's not hard to me, it's not a foreign concept. Whatever I do, I wanna do a level of fairness and I wanna make sure it is just. So that's my personal philosophy. I encourage others to adopt the same. And when you apply that to you know, equity-driven planning, whether it's parks or for cities, you certainly will get a better outcome and people respect you a lot more because you know it and you understand it. And someone says, wait a minute, I'm in this neighborhood. I haven't seen any investment in 20 years, yet I'm looking at this neighborhood. Why are they getting all the benefits and ours hasn't changed? That's a fair question. That's something in my world, I believe all of us as urbanists and planners, we need to address and speak out. It's really, um, I, I certainly agree, Mitch. Um, and and a, a great way to, to close the webinar, I think. I just, I wanna thank you so much for your time today um, and for your insights and, and the you know, amazing work you're doing in New York City. Um, I wanna let everybody who's listening know that a recording of this session will be available on cnu.org within the next 24 hours. And to remind everyone to please join us on September 25th for Bring Back Main Street with Small Scale Manufacturing, the who, the why, and the how with Ilana uh, Proust. And, um, and I wanna thank Mitch one more time for sharing his insights with us today. It was a pleasure getting to talk with you. Thank you, Valerie, take care. Thank you everyone for joining us.
certainly enjoyed it. Great. Thanks so much.